So actually, uh, speaking of just kind of things in the past that are specific, there's something that I learned about you that I would love to unpack. You took the EBITDA of your company from 18 million to 441 million, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's in a absolutely wild. In a, fi in a five year period, I hesitate to ask a question so broad as how the hell did you do that? <laughs> but I'd like to go somewhere in that direction and unpack the most important mechanisms that at least created those results. Like if we could really distill it down to a few areas, what, what would that be? Well, for a start, Arman, if you were to open the dictionary to look at the expression low base, you would see a photo of that company, CS Energy, right? It was, it was at such a low point in a whole range of ways. And uh, there are a number of market factors. More than that, though, there were a number of internal factors about how that company had been run for a long period of time. Mm. It was a company that uh, generated electricity and sold it into the wholesale market in Australia. It was basically an a company run by engineers for engineers. Mm. There was no real commercial smarts and overlay onto that. A lot of good people doing what they knew best, but really when it came to commercial levers, uh, there was really nothing going on there that focused on those commercial results. When the market was good, the company performed well. When it wasn't good, the company performed really poorly. And I went in a time of particular underperformance in the market. So that was the first thing. And really just putting in the basic mechanisms for matching up any uh, investment that we might make to the value that was going to be driven out the back end of that. And always focusing on what value was going to come. Not, not, not spending $50 million on a power station overhaul just because it needed to be done or you know the periodic maintenance had rolled around. But to say, how do we actually maintain this asset so that it delivers the things we can sell into the market over the next three-year period? Mm -hmm. And it was just a change in paradigm around that. And, uh, and initially, I was pretty tough. The money stopped flowing because people mm -hmm. couldn't explain how value was going to be created. So there was that whole mind shift from, um, <laughs> from that you know, very engineering-based view of the world to a commercial view of the world. That was the first thing. The second thing was we had a couple of really, really major uh, disputes with key suppliers. For example, our largest power station, uh, the coal mine next door was owned by a different company, one of the large uh, global mining companies. We had no other source for coal. It had to come from there. And we were in a dispute with them because they had an onerous contract, which in other words was they lost money on selling us their coal. It was a, it was a long-term contract with lots of extension options. So they were doing everything they could to minimise their losses. And what that meant for us was the quality and consistency of coal, the, the, the quantities were so patchy, we didn't know how to cater for them or how to plan. Mm -hmm. And so we had to solve that dispute, which was worth tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to us over a period of time. It was, it was a really mm -hmm. big deal to do that. Um, there were also supply and demand and policy factors in the market that we had to sort out. But more than anything else, and the bit that I loved doing the most was the fact that the leadership in the company was terrible. And when mm. I say terrible, you know, once again, good people, but many in leadership positions did not have a leadership bone in their body. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't know how to hold people to account, how to stretch them, um, how to create value, how to, uh, how to look analytically at things. They were there just cranking the handle, as we like to say. So I really overhauled the leadership of the organization right from the CEO's office down. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when I walked out of there five years after I walked in, almost to the day, I looked at the organization and said, there are parts of this organization that are as good as any company you would walk into on the planet. And there are other parts where I would be unbelievably embarrassed to say that that was the company I ran for five years. <laughs> so you never, you, you never get to the stage where you've got a consistent, you know, the organization all comes with you and they're all singing from the same hymn sheet or anything else. It's... It's a matter of working on the things that you can most influence fastest, pulling the right value levers, and and you know some of the other stuff you're just going to have to let go of it. And that's that's yes. the way the world works, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the that's the fly over the top and uh, many scars to show for it, Armand. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love those scars though, and there's so much good stuff there. Um, 
you know, one of the things that uh, I often think about, and I'm really curious your your honest take on this, I believe that ultimately what a lot of great leaders do is they teach you how to think like them. And one of your first points there was asking people the simple questions of, you need to show me how this is going to create value, how your efforts create value, how your investment idea is going to create value, how you are going to be accountable to this project, and how do we know what success even looks like. But a lot of people don't even know how to answer that question for themselves. In six months from now, when we complete this project, how do you know this was successful? Like, have we mm. defined that clearly and crystallized it? Do you agree that a lot of what you've done is teach people how to think like you? In other words, teach people how to run an organization and take a little sliver of it? Or do you think it's 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 a little bit different there? I'm curious your take on that. I, I think that's probably 95% of it, Armand, to tell you the truth. Whoa. I think I think you're spot on there. I think it's making sure that the people below you have the right mindset uh, and attitude and behaviors and and value set that they're actually putting their attention and energy into the right things. There's this old expression that says uh, what my boss is interested in, I am completely fascinated by. Mm. And and you send out signals to people about what your expectations are, what you will stand for and what you won't stand for, the things you'll die in a ditch over, uh, the things that you are pretty relaxed about. And people get to know you fairly quickly. So I have a, another belief that every senior executive or CEO has a lifespan, a, a use by date in their mm -hmm. role, because you do lose effectiveness over time, in my, yeah. in my opinion. Uh, and you've got to know when that is, and you've got to be a bit adult about it <laughs> and a bit courageous yes. about what you need to do at that point. Uh, and to tell you the truth, when I got to the end of that five-year stint, I'd had about as much impact as I was going to. Um, you know, you people just knew that, huh? Yeah, people were tired of hearing Marty talk. You know, they'd just roll their eyes and, oh, is he still talking? You know, that's a, mm -hmm. So you get, a, you get a bit of that, right? But teaching, teaching leaders how to think, teaching them what's important and giving them that constant feedback, that constant encouragement when you see the right things happening. Um, we used to have this expression, reward the approximations of desired behavior. When, mm -hmm. someone, when, when someone even looked like they were heading towards the sort of behavior you want, you oh. get them. You put the arm around the shoulder. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I'm looking for. Well done. Good on you. Let's keep going. That's fantastic, you know. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you see those little green shoots pop up, you encourage them, you reward them, and, and you get people doing more and more of that. Uh, but sometimes, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting things is trying to explain some of these concepts to someone who's been in an industry for 40 years mm -hmm. and has, has never been exposed to them is kind of like trying to explain colour to a blind person. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really difficult. Yeah. And, and I could talk all day long and it doesn't matter how articulate I am or how many different ways I try and so phrase right. it or, or communicate or how many channels I use. Sometimes the only thing you can do is provide contrast. And when I say provide contrast, hire someone who already has all that stuff. And then you go, hey, guys, see Jenny over here that I've just hired? Mm. Do that. Do that. Wow. That's, that, that. That's what good looks like, right? Just watch yeah, what you can only talk about it so much. You can only, totally. yeah. Totally, yeah. yeah. So there's a fair bit of that, but but I think teaching teaching the executives and the leadership how to think and how to act and where to put the pressure on as well. When when you mm -hmm. see people doing things that are outside of our value set, well, it's you know, I hate to say this, but in my company, it wasn't just written on the wall. Like you, you follow it, and if you step out of bounds, you're going to know about it. And so <clears> I, I was really serious about that. And when I saw leaders who would let that um, let those types of things pass and not comment on them or not hold people to account for them, I viewed that very, very dimly. Um, mm. So I'd always be happy to step in and say, you know, this you don't get a free kick on this stuff, right? This is <laughs> it's not optional. Yeah, I, ha I have to go into that with you because it's something yeah, that I did want to talk about today. Um, you know, it's funny because yesterday I posted, uh, I posted a video and a thought came to me on one of my walks and I just said, what needs to be said today? I said it to myself and I was like, huh. There is this conflict that people typically have with, there is so much fear around this idea of what needs to be said, the idea of what some people call crucial conversations, caring conversations, just generally uh, uh, embracing a level of what could appear as conflict or even uncomfortable truths. And often I think that we're so quick to run from the truth in any given situation. It's very frustrating for me 
when I run into that situation with people, when I know that there's something this person, this whether it be a client or whatever it might be, they there's a truth that they should just speak in this moment that would alleviate all of the bullshit. And we could just get right into it and be human beings and solve all of this. Why do people avoid uh, uh, the, the truth so much and, and not say what needs to be said? And how did you encourage people? It sounds like you did a phenomenal job of just nipping that and being like, oh, I'll, I'll handle it and let me show you what it looks like. Why, why do people do that? Well, I think we're all built with a natural conflict aversion. And this goes back a long way. This is, this is in our DNA. This is reptile brain stuff. It's really about the fact that acceptance and positive regard used to be crucial to our survival. Mm. And we still all have that in us. So I defy anyone to say, I don't get a little bit of a tweak when I think about stepping into a conflict situation. But in the game of leadership, this is, this is the number one career killer. Yeah. If you can't handle conflict comfortably, you are going to be in a world of pain. You are going to hate your life. Because it compounds. Al almost, almost everything you do has the potential for conflict when you're a leader. Every decision you make is going to have someone who doesn't like that decision. And the higher up you go, the more people don't like it. Um, every time you contribute in a group forum, you're inviting criticism and, and you know, dissent and conflict. Every time you have a one-on-one -on -one uh, conversation with one of your team members, the same thing is happening. You're, you're potentially going to go into conflict with them. And we avoid that like the plague. Mm. And the problem is we are so self-absorbed. <laughs> but we are. We, 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 you know, I, I've seen leaders Absolutely do this true. over and over and over and over again. They think about what it means to them. To them. I'm afraid. I'm anxious. I'm nervous. I'm apprehensive. I don't like these feelings. And I'm focusing inwardly on, on what's going on for me. Yes. The very, very biggest tip I used to give to my leaders was think about it from the other person's point of view. Now, here's something that for me as a leader, I found, and I, I don't use this word lightly, Aman, I found this heartbreaking as a leader. Hmm. When I would go into an organization, I would find people who were old. They'd been like almost as old as me in their 50s. Hmm. And I'd, I'd see people who'd been in their careers for lots and lots of years with really, really obvious obvious flaws in their behavior or their performance and no one had ever bothered to tell them <laughs> yeah. no leader throughout their whole career had the courage to sit them down and say hey look here's an observation i've made <laughs> you know what i mean just that just that really simple conversation it's, it, as you say very about the truth hard. very it, hard yeah but it's yes. but it's not if you can condition yourself to do it and the, the only way Correct. to condition yourself to do it is to understand how important it is to the people you're leading this is about your duty of care it's about it's about how much you can be in the service of others, yes. um, and I, I'm not a uh, I'm not a huge fan of the concept of servant leadership because I think that can very quickly morph into um, you know letting your people run the show and dictate terms. I'm as opposed so happy to the leader you just said it. that. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. Yes, um, but I think for a strong leader, uh, being strong and decisive and still being in service of your people, I think is a good thing, and so that helps you to get over the times when you would otherwise avoid something because you know it's best for them or it's best for the organization. So you step into that and you, you know, you put on the big boy pants and away you go. Yes. You, you mentioned right at the end there, best for the organization. Uh, that's another perspective that's very important. Even if it's not about the people around you, what is best for the organization? And if you're in a company because you actually believe in the vision or the product or the service and you want to see that come to fruition, you have to take yourself out of the equation. You, you have to get out of the way. And oftentimes I find that a lot of this comes down to the individual emotions that they're protecting or ego. And ego is such a killer for so many people because they just don't know how to regulate themselves. They don't know how to get out of the way. They don't have self-awareness. And that's why I also think emotional intelligence is so, so important. And a lack of emotional intelligence means more bullshit. And so okay. one of the things I love, I love about your whole approach to this with, you know, I mean, you literally call it no bullshit leadership. Why is there so much bullshit? And, and, and I'm so happy when, <laughs> because it's like we, we both can't stand the fluffy stuff. And mm. all of the content these days is from people who want to sit and talk about the people side of things, learning to cultivate uh, culture in an organization. But there's no talk about 
Do you know what it takes to take a company from 18 million to 444, 441 million? And by the way, in EBITDA, everyone likes to talk revenue. <laughs> yeah, You're yeah. talking about profit. <laughs> So there's an element of we got to cut the bullshit out while we care about our people. Why is there so much bullshit that is rewarded uh, in this leadership space? Because I think it's all garbage. A lot of that stuff. I'm sorry, but I just I don't think it's helping oh, our leaders. Don't don't apologize to me, Aman. That's why I'm here. OK, it's specifically for this reason, because I think a lot of the stuff that they talk about, there's nothing wrong with it. It's it's aspirational and the things that uh, that a lot of leadership pundits talk about is you know things like humility and transparency and fallibility and okay that's fine but it's almost completely disconnected the process of leadership from the need to get results and if you're yes. not getting results as a leader you're not serving your stakeholders and when i say stakeholders yes there are shareholders but also your your employees your suppliers your customers um i always laugh when i hear the um that pithy little cliche people before profits which which i think i think means you know serve the people who work for your organization first but when i hear people before profits i say well what people what are you going to let your employees exactly. rule the roost exactly. and then <laughs> and then take the money out of your customers pockets which ultimately in the ultimately in the long run, or are you, are you going to rob from your shareholders because you haven't got the guts to, you know, stretch your people and, and create an organization that actually performs. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm a huge believer in the fact that it's in everyone's best interests to drive for the results that are going to create value for your customers, shareholders, employees, and everyone in long term interests of everyone. That's the only way to go. And that takes strength. You can't yes. do that if you're a, you know, mamby pamby permissive leader. Mm -hmm. Now that the thing with all these aspirational um, things about leadership is that they sound like they should be true. Right. So when someone says, you go, oh, of course. Oh, yes, yes, great leaders are humble. They're not arrogant. Well, okay, maybe. But if you're humble and you're indecisive, that is disastrous. Mm -hmm. Like if you're humble and you're decisive and you're strong, that can be really, really powerful. It's like rocket fuel. And the same with fallibility. You know, if you're, if you're fallible and you're competent, that's awesome. That can be really powerful. But if you're fallible and incompetent, it's disastrous. <laughs> no one's going to work for you. They, they, they're going to lose confidence in you so quickly. So we hear these things that sound like they should be true. Yes. We sign up to them, we aspire to them, and we think to ourselves, oh, yeah, that's me. I'm a fallible guy. And then we go away and we do absolutely nothing. We don't do anything with it. We don't need to. There's no, there's no <clears throat> impetus on us to change or to improve or anything else, we just feel warm and comfortable about it. Correct. And and warm and fuzzy isn't where I live. So you know, if, as as you can quickly attest, if you talk oh, to you're anyone who's ever worked for me. <laughs> you're the man. Oh, man. This is such, I'm so, so glad we're doing this because this, yeah, is, totally. this is what the world needs to hear. And we're going to do it one person at a time. We're Absolutely. Gonna, we're going we're gonna to get this done because this is so important. Marty, isn't it ultimately just this, this bullshit and this fuzzy stuff and all of the things that sound good that we should focus on that create and and I and I want to be a little careful here. I'm not going to name any particular names, but a lot of the so-called leaders that are putting this content out into the world have never been in the positions that you've been in. First of all, mm. I'd like to kind of just point that out. They've never been a an executive in a large organization that either they started or joined and grew. They don't have that direct experience. They sit and they theorize about these things and they talk and they go, oh, well, I went into an organization. I uncovered what makes it great. And then they go do a TED talk about it. And, and, and that's not the same thing. We're talking about the real deal here. We're talking about what it takes. And all that stuff, the fuzzy stuff, isn't it just virtue signaling and politics that has made its way into business that doesn't belong there? Like, yeah. What I, is that stuff? Yeah, I, I think... <laughs> I, th I think it's sort of mutated along the way. I think there are um, there are grounds and bases for a lot of this stuff, but mm -hmm. I think the way it's been interpreted and the way uh, executives who know, because just remember the very first instinct of an executive who knows they're deeply flawed is to cover that, and and if they can if they can wrap themselves in virtue, then they're going to feel better about themselves and keep up the facade for the rest of the organisation that they have to lead. 
And I've come across yes. that more than once in my um, my narrow career. So um, so I think that, that that there's nothing wrong with the principles. It's just that they can so easily be used for evil rather than good. Mm. And and is culture important? Yeah, culture is everything. Culture is culture is how your people behave and perform in a way that's going to drive value. But right. culture isn't all about you know you know having having drinks on a Friday afternoon and playing table tennis together and you know all getting on well and kissing and cuddling. That's not what it's about. Culture is about mm. performance, and and the leadership that you provide has to drive the culture, which will in turn drive the performance. But the culture is a culture of you know. Um, uh, robust challenge you know we don't yes. we don't we don't sit around and be polite to each other when we've got something to say we say it we're paid to have an opinion we're not we're not we're not paid to sit there and nod and smile right mm -hmm. we're paid at senior levels to take risks to understand what's going on to inject our expertise and capability and experience and to make a difference based on that but this polite facade it's almost a ritual that goes on in executive teams and boardrooms where okay I can see you're a complete idiot, but I'm not going to call you out on that today because right. then next week you might call me out. And mm. so there's a, there's a polite truce in most teams. And um, it's funny when we start to talk about high performance, quite often, and, and I've got to tell you, I'd, I'd love a quarter for everyone who said to me in an interview, I build high performing teams. Mm. <laughs> and of course, my next question is always, okie doke, why don't you talk me through that? And mm -hmm. they really don't understand what a high-performing team is. It basically seems to come down to, look, everyone got on really well. We collaborated together. You know, we achieved some things. Everyone was happy. It was a high-performing team. And I'm sitting there mildly apoplectic in my head going, how do, you, how, do you actually, how do you actually get value and performance out of that? You know, value and performance comes from tension and constructive tension. Like high-performing teams are bloody hard to run. They're hard. They, are, yes. they aren't easy. You know, they at any minute, things can blow up because you know you've got to keep a check on it. But when you when you're dealing with a team of A players who all have very strong opinions and drives and everything else, it's hard to keep them under control. Um, but as I like to say, it's a lot easier to rein in a stallion than it is to flog a donkey. Mm. <laughs> you got some good analogies. You know, and a lot of people, I'm sure, I, I just hear the voices because, especially in the in the wider culture today, a lot of what I'm saying and even you're saying is misunderstood and and not yet celebrated. But we're we're working on that. We're going to change mm. that. And I can hear the voices saying, "Oh, come on, guys, come on, Armand, where's the empathy? Where's the focus on people? Where's the understanding of?" you know, inclusion of, of all ideas, my idea, th this and that, and a lot of these things that have become very popular today. My, my take on it is, and I think you address this, I'm just going to put it basically in different words because we totally agree on this. If people came before profit, all of those things are beautiful, they're wonderful, but if people came before profit, what organization are they going to be working at where I can take care of them? Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. We have to be high performance, results driven, value creators that build a profitable company and put all those stakeholders, absolutely, like they're, you know, everybody's important. The people are very important, but that comes secondary. And as you said, there's a, and, and good culture is not happy and ice cream Sundays. It's tension actually. Mm. And it's not family. It's a high performance team. It's like playing for the, you know, I'll use a sports analogy. It's like, playing for the Chicago Bulls and everybody is fighting for that starting position. And if you don't show up that day, there's a whole bench of people ready to go. I mean, there's so many analogies that could be used for this, but it's like a lot of the organizations that I've stepped into, particularly as a consultant at times, have this idea that good culture is a family. Mm. And I mean, families, most families are dysfunctional <laughs> <laughs> and, and they don't know how to handle conflict and there is no tension. And when there is tension, it's a blow up and then an avoidance and a blow up and then an avoidance. This is that's that's what family looks like. High performance team is like no bullshit. So <laughs> I, 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 I say this yeah. to drive the idea of like, I love people and I am a very charismatic, empathetic leader. And I can tell you are as well. 
and people are incredibly important. Hiring the right people, creating an organization where they are thriving and they feel like they have a vested interest in seeing that vision become a reality, but not at the expense of results and, and mm. profit. And, and it has been completely, as you say in your book, decoupled. You know, those two things have been completely decoupled. Yeah, yeah, it has. And um, Aman, I'll just comment briefly on the Please. concept of family culture, because I do think this is uh, critical. People people see family as being an incredibly uh, attractive thing because it gives you total acceptance. Now, that means acceptance regardless of your choices, because remember, you can't choose your family. Yeah. And there are some things about family culture that are enormously beneficial, like loyalty and trust and those sorts of things that are really good if you can incorporate them in your culture. But the dark side of family culture is you don't hold people to account. And so mm. I, I like to use the analogy of um, having Thanksgiving dinner. And we have to invite Uncle Arthur. But Uncle Arthur turns up and by 10.30 in the morning, he's half pissed, he's leering at his nieces and making a general ass of himself. And that's, and that's Uncle Arthur. Now, that's the time when you should be saying to Uncle Arthur, mate, that sort of behaviour is not acceptable in our family. If you want to stay here for Thanksgiving dinner and make it to midday, then you need to pull your socks up. You need to stop drinking, you need to settle down, and you need to be respectful to everyone else who's here. Right? That's, that's the sort of conversation you need to have. But what happens instead is that everyone goes, oh, look, don't worry that's just Uncle Arthur. Mm. And it's only one day a year. Just stay away from him. You know, he's okay. It's all good. And this is why the acceptance of people's choices in a family culture is not healthy. And if you try and bring that into a corporate situation or any business that you're trying to run, it's going to kill you. Because everyone else looks at that and goes, oh, oh so that's acceptable, is it? So Uncle Arthur, that's the acceptable standard. So even if I'm just not a complete, you know, Neanderthal, I'm going to be better than Uncle Arthur. And so I've got a place here. And, and the whole, the whole culture, the whole, the whole expectation and standard of the organization just sinks, just sinks. Yes. Yes. Oh, phenomenal, phenomenal story analogy. And I'm going to clip that and turn it into it. That's so good. We've got to share that. Right. We've got to Thank share you. that. So Marty, you accomplished so much in your, in your, corporate career so much and you invested so much time so much energy you got these incredible results you you know you turned cs energy into this incredible organization um and you're great at it you're amazing at it it's very clear why did you why did you leave why the change what happened i think ultimately over time Aman, i learned what truly drives me i learned in fact let me rephrase that I was always driven, but I finally worked out what draws me. And it's mm. a slightly different thing. It's a slightly different distinction. I knew for a long time that the thing that, um, that gave me my highest level of satisfaction was having impact on others. And when I was getting towards the end, when I did that job at CS Energy, it was a five-year contract. I had a three-year contract with a two-year extension. And the chairman came to me and asked me to extend, and I said, I just need to think about this a bit. I'm not sure whether I still want to keep going down this CEO path. And it was probably at that point, two years before I finished in 2018, that I decided that I wanted to do something more. Now, when I start thinking about the way I could offer my contribution to the world in terms of what I knew and my experience and, and the way I did things, I wanted to paint on a bigger canvas. And I thought to myself, even if I ran the largest company in Australia, let's say, you know, um, you know, 150 billion market cap, employees all over the world, hundreds of thousands of employees. How many am I genuinely going to impact? Hmm. And knowing knowing what it's like from the CEO chair, well, look, maybe I'm going to impact 100 people and 50 of those don't want to be impacted. Mm -hmm. So even though, yeah, I could I could go and do more stuff, it's all about achievement of goals which is there's nothing wrong with that right we know that yeah but it's about what am i going to do that's going to drive me for the rest of my life to just keep wanting to get better and better and more curious and learning more and contributing all of that back because i'm just sort of 
like I'm 59 years old. And I'm just starting to get the hang of this thing, right? <laughs> this life thing, just starting to get good at it. <laughs> and and I just realized that that I had more to contribute and the way I wanted to do it. Now, things have worked out pretty well. Um, as a lot of people say to me, I have been hit in the ass with a rainbow. I'm a lucky guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and things tend to fall into place for me. But when my daughter, Emma, came to me and said, you know, come on, Dad, you've got to do something more. Like you're, you're sort of a bit wasted, which sort of sounds weird, but you're sort of a bit wasted doing this work for other organisations. You need to get out in the world. The stuff that you know that you talk to me about is highly valuable. Mm-hmm. And so we started off, and I've got to tell you now, Aman, when I get an email from someone, and these come in pretty regularly, that says, thank you so much for your podcast. Mm-hmm. I was, and they'll tell a story about how they were lost as leaders. They were fearful. They were anxious. They were underperforming. Their people didn't like them. And then all of a sudden they said, you have changed my life. All of a sudden I started listening to your podcast. It changes the way I look at the world. It changes the way I look at my job and my people. And now I'm growing in confidence and I'm not there yet, but you've put me on a completely different path. Now that to me says more than, you know, making another half a billion dollars for a company, right? That is, that is about real impact on real people. Mm-hmm. And they come from all over the place. They come, you know, there's countries all over the world that are listening to this we have no idea right. about. And most of the people are never going to spend a cent with, with our business. And that's fine. You know, right. this is about the opportunity and the ability and the privilege to reach people where they are and to make a difference to them. Mm-hmm. And so this is what, this is what, you know, this is what lights me up. And this is, this is, this is how I know that this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And it's drawing me to having more and more impact and exposure if I can. Mm-hmm. Isn't that an amazing feeling? Um, just, just I, I think there, it's incomparable to to anything else that a person could achieve in their career. Just getting that email, getting that message, getting that recognition. It's not even about the. It's 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 just like a little reminder that the direction that you're pointing yourself and what you're putting out into the world is extremely impactful like as you said working on one business growing one business at impacting the people in that organization is a beautiful thing wonderful thing but i am for one i'm so happy that you've made this decision to go this direction because i know that we need this i need this i need this you know <laughs> as a leader and i've spent years consuming nothing but fluffy language and aspirational stuff and so to have that balance of both, I think, is so, so wonderful. So now as you've begun to really go in this direction, you've already created an incredible podcast. You have your book coming out. What does this look like? What is the vision of how this will play out for you? The vision of how it plays out is that with um, greater exposure, we have more people picking up the content. Emma and I are constantly talking about what's next. So we've, we've, we're really, really happy with our baseline offering, which is what you'll see in the book. That's our, that's our key that unlocks this leadership task that says, you know, mm-hmm. here are the sorts of things that you need to do if you want to become a really effective and successful leader. And that's the stuff that, um, that obviously I learned over a long period of time as to what those most fundamental and essential elements were. So I've basically had to... Um, simplify the leadership task down to these seven core things to pursue as a leader uh, and not to oversimplify it. So there are a whole lot of things that I've left out. I don't, I don't teach hard skills of business, finance, marketing, you know, operation, mm-hmm. asset management, anything like that. The business schools are awesome at that and I leave them to do it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know too many people that have come out of their MBA program as better leaders. Right. I know a lot that have come out as better executives and a lot smarter and a lot more capable but I haven't seen many come out as better leaders. And in fact, funnily enough, Aman, I have seen some come out as worse leaders because not only not only haven't they learnt much about leadership, they've picked up an extra dose of arrogance by getting their MBA from a top school. And so, and so sometimes it can be almost counterintuitive. Um, and, and the way I phrase everything, it's, it's imperative statements. It's do this, right? If you want to be a leader, you think about whatever you want. Talk to yourself in your quiet moments about whatever you want to talk to yourself about, but you've got to put rubber on the road. You've got to drive results. So deliver value, handle conflict, build resilience, 
work at the right level. Like these are, it's your basic how to, but yeah. it's hard, right? It's simple, but it's not easy. Mm-hmm. And this is why a lot of people won't, won't go there. And so what I've tried to do is make it as practical and easy as I can. You find yourself in this situation. Okay, here's half a dozen questions you should be thinking about. You're struggling with this situation. Here's how to get your head around it because this thing is 90% will and 10% skill. You know, mm. you want to know how to make a good decision? Well, don't ask everyone's opinion. That's stupid. Like everyone, everyone will want to give you their opinion, but then you end up in a loop of decision-making by consensus, which is just about the worst way to do anything. Mm. So, so instead, of, instead of trying to seek consensus, you've got an accountable decision-maker, make them accountable. You, you got the call on this, make the call. And I don't want you spending six months making the call, you know, make mm-hmm. the call quickly. You don't need to consult every person on the team. You don't need to talk to everyone in the organization to get their approval. You certainly mm-hmm. don't need the approval of the people above you. You're paid to make that decision, make it. Right. And so it sounds as though it's a little bit, um, a little bit harsh, but the whole accountability around decision-making and the need to move quickly is the thing that will most change the performance of the organization. Hmm. It's the it's the permission for people to move fast, the permission to choose excellence over perfection, and the permission to stop doing the things oh, that boy. don't create value. There's so much we do that's yeah. just a waste of time. Absolutely. I think that's one of the most challenging things for me, and I think I've gotten much better at it. But teaching people how to properly prioritize their work to understand what are the true value creators that move the needle is quite the challenge. And um, I think the most important thing is to make it very clear, where are we going? Like, what is the ultimate outcome here? What's the North Star? And work backwards from that, develop OKRs, whatever those goals might be, making them very simple and having it to a level where a person can be accountable to themselves, knows exactly whether or not they are successful on any given day because it's like, this is my goal, this is where we're going. And yet though, a lot of people struggle with that ability to go, well, um, I guess I could update this spreadsheet for the next hour. <laughs> or, you know, and, and it's like the spreadsheet thing becomes this easy dopamine hit sort of task and then all of a sudden people lose themselves in that. And you ask them, and you and you don't want to micromanage anybody. And you ask them, well, you know, what did your day look like? And I think this is the power at times of you know accountability on a daily basis. That person working with their manager, doing some level of stand up. Um, but they, we we lose ourselves. Even I do that as a leader, right? So it's like I understand because it's like, oh wow, I just completely wasted that last hour. How do we begin to teach ourselves how to more properly prioritize our time? and drive results. I think a lot of people struggle with this. Yes, and I think part of it is in communication, Aman, from the from the very top of the organization. The first thing is that people need to see how their contribution makes a difference. And you you touched on this. I have a particular way of saying this that, that most people find quite refreshing. Um, it's that when people come into work each day, they want to know three basic things. What are your expectations of me? How am I performing against those expectations? And what does my future hold? Hmm. Now, if everyone actually knew those three things when they came into the office each day, you get a very different outcome in terms of their motivation and positive regard and discretionary effort. But the trick is that if the organization doesn't have a really clear purpose, really clear, Mm -hmm. so we know why we're here, we know who we serve and why, a strategy for how to achieve that that says, Here's the markets we're going to play in. Here's the type of customer we're going to go after. Here's how we compete in that market against others. And here's what our unique value proposition is. And then from there, drop down the tactical and the operational plans as we as we drop that through. Now, having the consistency between all of those things at the different layers that end up on someone's desk as a task and being able to show that connection, that's sort of the holy grail. Right. To be able to have that clarity top to bottom around this is why we're here, this is our strategy for achieving it, and this is what good looks like for you right now. And and that loses a lot in translation as well. Yeah. So, for example, in CS Energy, in my head, our strategy was crystal clear. 
abundantly clear, so obvious to me. Go just one layer down to my direct reports, the executives of the company, smart, experienced guys, they didn't quite get it the same way. They didn't quite get it the same way. Not because they weren't smarter than me, because some of them were, but purely because they weren't the ones that spent hours and hours and hours letting it germinate in their heads as they were developing. They weren't the ones that were focused solely on that. I was. And they contributed in different parts, and the board obviously contributed and approved it. But just that one layer down, they described things slightly differently. They'd understand them differently. Go another layer, and it's it's more diluted than it was before. And you get down to the front line of an organisation where you've got a team leader telling their people what to do, and there'd be times I'd hear those conversations, and I'd be in my head going, that's almost the opposite of what I want. That's <laughs> like, how did that happen? Right. <laughs> so. So it's you know it's it's a it's a communication issue, it's mm. it's an understanding issue, and it's a care issue because a lot of leaders unfortunately um, have this uh, posture of benign neglect. Mm. They're not bad people. They they want to do a good job, but they just simply don't take the action that makes that a reality. Wow, that's really good stuff, Marty. You, you talked about the ability to make decisions. And um, I think that something you mentioned really was helpful for me around not consulting too many people when you're going to make that decision. Can you think back to some of the toughest decisions you had to make and just sort of walk through the process of how you make them? Yeah. And I think um, when I talk about decision making, Aman, I talk about speed over accuracy every day. Yeah, Twice on Sunday, speed over accuracy. Over perfection right? as well, yeah. yes. Speed over accuracy, accuracy is a really important concept when you're making decisions because a lot of people freeze on their decisions and procrastinate and avoid. And it's so easy to lose track of how long you've had a decision on your desk for. It's really easy to lose track of. Mm. And the number one thing I say to leaders is, if you think you're making decisions in a timely manner, why don't you track your next three or four big decisions? Just write down just very quickly when you got the decision, who informed you, what the process was, blah, 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 and just see how that unfolds. And when I guarantee when you go back to it at the end of making that decision, you will find that much more time elapsed than you expected or, or than you thought had elapsed. And so I say that a decision that's 80% right today is infinitely better than a decision that's 85% right next week, mm -hmm. which is infinitely better than a decision that's 90% right next month. The way I came up uh, on this concept was that in a number of executive roles, not just my CEO role, I had to make decisions in a crisis or an emergency where I didn't control the timer. I, di I, didn't, have, I didn't have the luxury of time. It was driven by uh, a media story where I'd have you know cameras and microphones shoved in my face, or it would be driven by a major incident that had been reported in the news and we had to resolve the incident, or uh, a regulatory breach where we had regulators knocking on our door. At those times, you don't get the luxury of yeah. meandering over a decision. You have to move fast. You have to think quickly. You have to get the right consultation around you quickly and know how to draw that out of people. Because many people, as we said before, are still in the pantomime of, well, I'll just nod and smile and tell Marty what he wants to hear because he's the boss. So drawing all of that out's hard. Uh, and of course, um, you know, knowing how much data is enough, how much consultation is enough and being able to act on that quickly. And what I actually found over time, to my great surprise, was that the decisions I was making under extreme pressure, where I didn't control the clock, were at least as good as decisions that I made when I had all the time in the world. And so what it said to me was, mm, okay, well, this is super, super interesting. If I can make decisions that well under pressure, why don't I just try and have the mental frame of treating everything with that level of pressure? Just putting that pressure on myself to say, right, I know I've got all the time in the world to make this decision, but I'm going to discipline myself to make it by Friday because mm -hmm. by Friday I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can get this data and I'll have enough to move forward with. And if I find out next week or the week after that I got a few things wrong, well, it's going to be easy to tweak and we'll, and we'll move and we'll adapt and we'll keep going forward because momentum is so much more important mm. than having a perfect decision because nothing's ever 100% right. It's nothing ever. Yeah. And would you apply this to 
even things that maybe don't necessarily have a timer attached to them, like, should I partner with this person? Should we acquire this business? Should we X, Y, and Z? Things that could sort of sit there and linger and maybe things come to the surface. The more time goes by, maybe you realize, wow, that person wasn't actually who I thought they were. You know, because sometimes I find you, if you give the other party time, if there's another person involved, Oftentimes you see that actually the sense of urgency that was originally there isn't there and wasn't real. And maybe I'm conflating two things here, but I'm curious, like, is there any situation where it makes sense to to give something time? Oh, I, I, I think there certainly is. And um, when we talk about those types of scenarios, particularly when you think of going into a partnering arrangement, uh, you need to be able to do your due diligence. You need to be able to um, have a few laps of the track before you make a call on that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. And you need to let people show their true colours. And you won't find that until you're in a stressful a pressure or a conflict situation. Right. And so and so, if you don't have, I mean, everyone sounds awesome when you sit around the boardroom table and say, this is going to be so good. We're going to, you know, we're going to change the world. We're, we're going to do great things together. How good is it going to be? And then you lack the attention to detail. Now, I'll give you an example of this. At CS Energy, we did a joint venture, which was one of the big commercial levers that I pulled. We did a joint venture with a retail company. We had um, generation capacity that they needed, and they had all of the retail uh, electricity sales systems that we didn't have. Mm. And so it was sort of like a perfect sort of marriage. And it started off with me having, um, I, I, I was going to say a rather boozy lunch, but it actually turned out not to be. It was actually, it was actually quite a... Quite a quite a serious lunch with um, with the other CEO. And in that probably hour and a half or two hours, we actually laid out a roadmap where we said, okay, we understand what each of us has. Ideally, we'd like it to shape something like this. But it depends on what we find when we start, you know, lifting the, lifting the, uh, the hood up and seeing what's under the hood. Yeah. And so what we're going to do, let's put, let's put our teams together and get them to start working and talking about this. And so we had an in principle where we understood what we were trying to achieve, but both of us said, all right, on, on one end of the spectrum, our ideal top of the line option is this one over here. If we can make that happen, that's where we want to be. In the worst case scenario, we can sell you some, uh, you know, future um, put options over here, right? That's, that's the lowest level of partnering we'll do. And over here, we have the highest level of partnering. So we're going to send our teams to work with each other with the objective of getting as close to that optimum range as we can and they're going to go through all the ugly bits they'll right. they'll find out all the things that are going to be sticking points or problems and so all of these things happen incrementally mm-hmm. and it takes a long time to actually consummate a deal like that but the decisions that you make at each point in time can be made very quickly mm-hmm. so i made a decision in two hours over lunch as did my um as did my counterpart that we would put our companies to task to try and get the deal together. That was a decision. And that led us to the next stage. And then we did a two week sort of lockdown with our our two teams to try and work out what they would do and how they might structure it and where our rub points might be and then report Mm -hmm. back. So that happened quickly. And then we made a decision based on that. All right, well, let's take this off the table, put these things on the table and let's go again. And so you're sort of making decisions all the time, even though it's iterative. Yes. To, to, on, on this, I find this so fascinating. Do you tend to think forward and play chess three moves ahead? Or do you allow things, are, are you very present and you just kind of allow things to come to you and now is the time to make the decision about this? That's a really good question. I haven't thought about this. <laughs> I think it's a combination, to tell you the truth. I'm a massive believer in set that ultimate intent, set the ultimate um, nirvana situation that you want and focus on that. And the way you get there, well, there's a thousand different paths and you can't force any path and it'll take some twists and turns and you may not get there, but um, but I'm a, a huge believer in letting things develop as they develop and, you know, peeling the next layer of the onion off and peeling the next layer of the onion off and, um, and I do believe in very much uh, the forces that um, that operate in the universe that will signal to you at any point in time whether something is right or not. Some things that you think you mm. want that you think are right, they simply don't turn out. And for me, I just go, okay, well, that 
by definition, wasn't the right thing for me because it didn't happen. If it was the right thing for me, it would have happened. And so I've sort of got an almost, I wouldn't quite say fatalistic, but certainly a an affinity with mm -hmm. um, the flow of the universe, the, the flow of things that happen for reasons that may not necessarily be obvious to us at the time. Mm. But if you actually have that focus and energy directed towards an outcome, for me, it tends to play out. It, it <laughs> tends to it tends to sort of work out in that way, um, with with the right energy and focus and um, and desire to have yes. something happen like that. And you know, it's not just once again, it's not this airy fairy thing of you know, I meditated this morning and all of a sudden I won lotto. Um, it's not that. It's it's right. it's 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 more a case of if I really understand where I want to go, and I'm in tune with that then I'll make the right micro decisions on the way through as I see yes. things develop. I'll, I'll just, it'll, it'll just help me to have my attention on the things that are going to make the most difference to take me towards that objective or that, that desire. Yes. As you said, there's a thousand paths. Oh, totally. So totally. One of the troubles that I used to have is being attached to a path. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and, you, and you have to release that attachment and trust and know where you're going. As you said, what is that? I like that, the nirvana state that you're aiming for um but there's an infinite number of paths to get there and you kind of have yeah. to trust yourself it sounds like <laughs> as well for um, sure yeah well it takes it takes a lot of um i i think i want to say confidence it's not quite the right word mm -hmm. but you've got to be very very relaxed about the potential outcomes right you've got to be smart about making sure that your downside is protected so, <laughs> so that you don't you don't end up you know going off the edge of a cliff um, Thelma and Louise style. So you've got to be you've got to be a little bit careful about that. But by the same token, just that belief that whatever happens, it's going to be okay. And that takes mm -hmm. that takes a level of, I think probably confidence or groundedness maybe, um, to underpin that. And I'm I've got to tell you, Amal, I'm genuinely relaxed about mm -hmm. whatever happens. Genuinely, you know this hmm. this latest foray into the U.S. market. What's going to happen? I don't know. Will it work? I don't know. But yeah, you know, but it's an adventure. <laughs> It's awesome. It's it's where I need to be because I, I am driven by impact and I, I want to see what I can do with that and how big it can yeah. be. And other than that, you know, what if it doesn't work out? Oh, well, it wasn't meant to be. Yeah, and, and every time uh, another cliche, it sounds trite, but when a door closes, it's amazing that we're completely blind to the, to the other doors that exist. When one closes, many, many open and it could just redirect you to a different location that you had no idea that still reaches that nirvana state that mm. aim. So yeah, for sure. I, I, that has happened to me too many times. And so I've, mm. I've, that's what I let go. I'm like, okay, you know, the attachment to the way it should be is completely unnecessary. Marty, you, you have clearly through both experience and the input of information learned so much throughout your career so far. Um, what's your favorite leader? Who is your favorite leader? Well, I've got to tell you, I don't have too many that I look up to and say, that's an awesome leader that I want to emulate. I see lots of leaders where I love parts of what they do. Mm -hmm. And I can see strong leadership elements where I go, oh, that is your communication in this has been superb. Great communication style. You've paid attention. You obviously care about the outcomes. That's great leadership. So I tend to not want to romanticize um, a leader for leader's sake. Um, quite unfashionably, I think that um, Jack Welsh was a very good leader. And, and you know, he's obviously fallen from grace um, and then some uh, since his, you know, tenure in the 90s and uh, uh, up to 2000, whenever it was in GE. But the people who were close to him said that as as a leader, he was one of the best in terms of how he treated his people, how much how much care he had for them, um, how much he stretched and pushed them and brought out the best in them for sure, which mm -hmm. I think is a really admirable thing. And so those things, I can look at a guy like that who's, uh, as I said, unfashionably <laughs> unpopular mm -hmm. um, and say, you know, he had some real elements of yeah. great leadership there. And I look at then the uh, complete selfless humility of a Nelson Mandela and I go, mm -hmm that is leadership in a different way it's a different mm. style of leadership it's a different context for leadership because he had to be a unifier and being a unifier required a completely different set of leadership skills and capabilities which he had in spades but i i am just awestruck by his level of forgiveness 
that he had in him. Mm. The capacity mm. for forgiveness. I look at that and I go, I, I don't know. I'm not that guy. I mean, mm. <laughs> you know, what I mean, mm. yeah. As much as as much as I try and be a better person, I look at that and I just go, that is next level. That that you know, for for the things Absolutely. that he suffered and endured during his life, to then come out and be the unifier of that nation was just incredible. It's it's very very rare that you'll see someone like that in their time. And uh, you know, you look at you look at political leaders and the ones that people think are great leaders, well, sometimes they struggle to get shit done. And the ones that people say are terrible leaders, sometimes actually push through and make some pretty serious change. Um, we had a prime minister in Australia many years ago who was quite unliked. His name was mm. Paul Keating and he was quite unliked. He was, um, he was very arrogant, but he made some changes during that time in terms of the Australian economy and some of the um, uh, some of the policy settings that they had, which basically fueled almost thirty years of uninterrupted economic growth. Hmm. And he wasn't he wasn't well liked, and he didn't care to be well liked. But he knew he had a job to do, and he did what he did. Hmm. And so I look at those types of leaders, and I say, well, that's really impressive too to actually say, I know what this country needs. I know that I'm not going to be popular because of it, but I'm yeah. going to go ahead anyway. And um, and I think those types of leaders who are prepared to risk their personal stat, uh, standing and status yes. in order to do the right thing for what they could see for the organization of the country. I think those leaders are the most impressive. What would you recommend there in terms of likability factor and approval factor of your people? Um, do you think that that's, uh, that's, a, that's something good to emulate? Do you think that it's secondary to results and you know, emulating uh, that prime minister is a good path for most leaders? Well, I think the concept uh, and the mantra of a, a really good leader is going to be respect before popularity. Mm. You've got to put respect before popularity. Not everyone is going to like you. And uh, if you doubt that in any way, uh, anyone who's listening, walk outside onto the street, have a look at the next 10 people that walk past you, and I guarantee that you won't like all of those 10 and they won't like you, not all of them. <laughs> It's just, we're, we're humans, right? We yeah. identify with certain people and we don't identify with others. And yeah. so we've just got to get used to that. Not everyone's going to like us, but they need to respect you as a leader mm. because otherwise you don't have the power to do the job you need to do to bring them out and to serve the organisation. So you've got to be able to be respected. And that comes through a range of different things that you do as a leader. First and foremost, if you want to be respected, get rid of self-interest. And it's really hard to do. And there's very mm. few executives that do this really well. Uh, but if you can put self-interest aside and put the greater good for the organization and the team ahead of that, people notice that really, really quickly. And even if they don't like you, they will begrudgingly respect you. Um, mm. One of my favorite quotes was from um, an old Major League Baseball manager, Casey Stengel. I don't know if you know of Casey, but um, mm. he said that the secret of leading people is to keep the guys who hate you away from the guys who are still undecided. <laughs> like that's sort of yeah yeah it's a I it's like a it's, it's a witticism but it's you know but it's it's really it's the nub of it right you you yeah. can't be too worried about what people think about you if you are you'll really struggle to lead well and you'll struggle to do the things you need to do it takes up a lot of uh, uh unnecessary energy to constantly oh, yeah. yeah to constantly be okay this person has this problem with me i gotta spend this time with them to make them like me because then that will make me a better leader but I, I agree with you. I think it's a huge flaw. And actually, I mean, honestly, Marty, most of the greatest leaders were very cutthroat and not very liked. Uh, we often talk about, you know, Steve Jobs and his leadership style. And a lot of people just called him an asshole. And <laughs> he revolutionized everything about the way we live. Uh, and, and he single-handedly turned Apple around. And so there's just these stories over and over again of people who I think sacrifice that that personal uh, as you said it's that self-interest they remove that self-interest and instead think about the greater mm. good and that's very difficult to do I think there is a personality disposition there that some people have so I struggled with that I have a disposition for relationship and um, wanting to cultivate these very warm relationships across the board and in the beginning of my leadership years, that really hurt me because I was very liked, but I couldn't get the results I wanted and the respect I wanted when I needed it. And I had to learn 
to go to the other end of the spectrum, which is the, the asshole side of the spectrum. Not all the way, but just learn how to start moving in that direction. So I think another thing that people have to realize and that I talk about often is just the personalized approach to all of this. We all have a very different um, you know, set of characteristics and traits that make up our personality. Some people find it very easy to be that way. Some people find it more challenging, but there is objectively a, a good path toward, toward leadership. And that's mm. what we all have to learn, right? From people like you. I'm curious, Marty. So you, you, uh, when it comes to learning in general, podcasts, books, other than your book, <laughs> what, what has been a favorite book for you that has, uh, kind of shaped your journey with leadership? So I like things that challenge me and really uh, push my thinking. And when I say things, I mean all sorts of input. I don't want to, I don't want to go and watch uh, a feel good movie or TV show. I want something that I'm sitting there going, mm. Oh gee, I'm not sure if I like this <laughs> mm. yeah. or I'm not sure I agree with that. I'm, oh, I'm not feeling really comfortable. Like I always like to be pushed somehow. Yeah. And it's the same with the stuff I read. So I love stuff that just makes me think. And um, of course, going back to the very early basic leadership tomes that I used to sort of give me that uh, very you know, primary fundamental induction to leadership, John C. Maxwell, uh, great stuff if, if you want the basics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, little things like um, Ken Blanchard's uh, One Minute Manager. You know, just these it. little things you can pick up that just yeah. say, oh, okay, here's a couple of basics that make sense. Beyond that, being challenged, I love things that uh, are counter to the norm. So we all know that great masterpiece by Jim Collins, Good to Great. Yeah. There's another book that's way more interesting. Now, I'm not saying, don't, don't get me wrong, I would never say a negative word about Good to Great, but this other book called The Halo Effect by Phil hmm. Rosenzweig is fantastic because it says, hey, Good to Great's awesome. Um, you know, In Search of Excellence is awesome. But here's the flaw in their research methodology. And here's why things like the halo effect and attribution bias, once again, can play mm. into this thing. He's not saying none of it's true. What he's saying is all this stuff about the research teams and how many godzillion bytes of data they poured through and everything else doesn't necessarily mean that we should take it on face value. And as soon as you start interviewing someone and saying, hey, Armand, talk to me about why your company was successful over the last 20 years, then your attribution bias is going to come into play there. And who knows whether it's true because you haven't started off with dependent variables and an independent variable and tried to work out how they move over time. So I love to read things like that. So I love Malcolm Gladwell, you know, his, his yes. books like uh, outliers, yeah. you know, things like that. I just love it because it makes me think things that I could, it opens my eyes. It makes me think things right. that I couldn't think before. And one of my all-time favorite books is a book by Michael J. Sandel, who's a Harvard academic. It's called What Money Can't Buy. And the subtitle is The Moral Limits of Markets. Ooh. Now, I'm a, I'm a massive believer in markets. If a market exists and it functions and it has buyers and sellers, happy days, that's why we're here. Yeah. But there are some moral limits to that that are extraordinarily challenging concepts from both ethical and moral perspectives. And to read some of the examples he put in there, it's one of the few books I've been reading and I've had to actually put the bookmark in and close it and set it aside so that I could think about a point I'd read. It's, it's wow. one of those types of books. It's deep. I'm um, going to be reading all of these. I'm taking notes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're great. And, and look, you know, Michael Lewis is a great writer. Um, mm -hmm. I love Michael Lewis. Now, Moneyball uh, even though it's yeah. ostensibly about the Oakland A's Major League Baseball team, is probably the best strategy book I've read in a long time. Mm -hmm. It's about strategy, and that really hammers really home is. on the yeah, it really hammers home on the point of okay, so there's all this conventional wisdom lying around, harking back to our conversation earlier about desirable leadership attributes and virtue signaling. Here's all this conventional wisdom that the scouts run in terms of what's valuable in. A, a baseball playing draft yet we're undervaluing the things that actually score runs mm -hmm. how do we actually get the correct value for the things that put runs on the board and buy those at a discount because strategically people are looking over here at the stuff that conventional wisdom tells them to look at yes so so that's a that's a strategy book and it's it's gold it is it's gold it's in a beautiful movie as well now yeah uh, yeah um that's awesome thank you for that list 
I've only read about half of those, so I really look forward to the Halo effect in particular. That sounds That's a cracker. <laughs> phenomenal. Oh, cracker. I haven't I haven't uh, read it for a few years, but it, it's such a good read. I'll have to go back and revisit yeah. it. Yeah. That's the best thing about, you know, it's I, I, I am all about having a decent breadth of ideas, you know, and you know, kind of going wide when I need to. But the best thing is to just go back to the best books over and over and over again. There's a reason that a book becomes a classic that lasts beyond that initial year of marketing promotion. Your book will will definitely be doing that and I can't wait to get it out to people. Um, Marty, as we work toward wrapping up, if there was one thing that every leader listening really should focus on after this conversation, the one area that is like, take away from this conversation, take away from your experience, what is that? What would that be? Hmm. Now get out of your own head. Get get into your people. And this at its most core strip, stripped back definition is empathy. Just just grow your empathy. And by empathy, all, of, all that means is it doesn't mean that you sort of jump down into people's holes with them when they feel bad and cuddle them and, oh, isn't that terrible? You know, empathy with strength is so powerful. If you can see what's going on for someone else, because every individual you lead is going to be different. Every individual is going to be different. And your job as a leader is to get the most out of them for them and for the organization. People aren't happy unless they achieve. It's, it's fundamental to life. I I believe (laughs) wholly and solely that all self-esteem comes from achieving difficult things. That's it. Period. And, most leaders never Love give that. people most leaders never give people the opportunity to feel that because they're too afraid to stretch them what if they don't like me what if what if what if i piss them off that might be unproductive because we all know that happy workers are productive workers right yes it's complete bullshit happy workers aren't productive workers i can make people happy you know double <laughs> their pay give them fridays off free beer in the break room like you can make people happy but that's not going to make them fulfilled and satisfied in the long term. That's that short term sugar hit happiness. Yes. And what you really want for people is to show them and stretch them to help them achieve things they didn't think they could, because that's where they get the boost in self-esteem. That's where they get confidence and that's where they have impact. And so paradoxically, uh, what people think or what leaders think is bad for people is actually the best for them and for the organizational outcomes they're trying to achieve. Now, if you have empathy and you know that doing that for people is giving them an incredible gift that most leaders aren't courageous enough to give them. And if you can give them that gift of elevating them so they can achieve more than they thought they could, and you can do that repeatedly because every time they do it, they'll get more and more confident and they'll be able to keep doing it. And eventually you just stand back and watch them watch them fly. That's it. Now, it doesn't happen very often, right. but when it happens, it's the payback. That's the payback for all the other shit you have to go through, for all the other tough bits and the ugly bits and the hairy bits. That's the payback. Hmm. So think about how you lift that person, how you stretch them, and how you bring them out to that edge where they can do more than they thought they could. And that takes empathy. Absolutely phenomenal. That's that's a mic drop kind of uh, closer. (laughs) (laughs) Marty, uh, I am honored to have you on the show. This has been absolutely amazing. Um, I'm also looking forward to our future and our relationship and to support your work. And I'm very grateful and happy that uh, you have decided to go in this direction. This is beautiful, beautiful work. Any final words for listeners, watchers, where can they find you, follow up with you and just any final, final thoughts? Uh, I'm, I'm easy to find. It's martingmore.com, martingmore.com. Everything's there. So that's, that's the website to go to. Uh, and uh, get onto the No Bullshit Leadership podcast. It's it's out every week. We've got 155 odd episodes now. Uh, religiously, every Tuesday afternoon in the US, it drops, and uh, we try and keep it short and sharp, just to give you a little gift of clarity and uh, insight to add to your week. So uh, so jump jump onto that, and hopefully it can help you. Yes, thank you, thank you, Marty. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Amanda. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely.